Welcome to A Fresh Start with Dr. Bobby Mullins, Executive Director of A Fresh Start Ministries. At some time, we all need a fresh start. And each week on A Fresh Start TV program, you'll hear a relevant message straight from the Bible, providing examples and principles to show us how to start over again. Join us now for this edition of A Fresh Start as Dr. Mullins proclaims from the Word of God how to live the abundant life Jesus desires for all of us to experience.
wow. If there's a song that expresses the theme and purpose of a fresh start, it was that song, We Speak His Name in Joy and Pain. I know many of you today, you've been having trials and tribulations. It's been a tough year this past year. But I pray as we get started into 2010 that our program can especially be something that will edify you and encourage you in your Christian life. And I know that you could identify with some of the words of that song because you've been there and some of you may still be there. But tonight our program is a little more mellow than it's been in the past few weeks. In just a moment you'll see an excerpt from a sermon that I preached a while back at Calvary Baptist Church in Oak Ridge, Tennessee where my good friend Steve MacDonald is the pastor. But the title of the message was Snatching Victory from the Jaws of Defeat. And it was about the great prophet Elijah when he needed a fresh start in his life. Do you know he even got to the point in his life he was ready for it to end. And God had just worked miraculously through his life. But I want to tell you, I don't care where you are in your life. God can take you and make something of it. And Melody, my daughter, I'm thankful to have her in the studio today. And she's going to sing a beautiful song titled Alabaster Box. The room grew still as she made her way to Jesus. She stumbles through the tears that made her blind. She felt such pain. Some spoke in anger. Her folks whisper, there's no place here for her kind. Still on she came through the shame that flushed her face until at last she knelt before his feet and though she spoke no words everything she said was heard as she poured her love for the master from her box of Like oil from Mary's alabaster box. Don't be angry if I wash his feet with my tears and I dry them with my hair. You was a prisoner to the sin that had me bound. And I spent my days, poured my life without measure into a little treasure box I thought I found. Until the day when Jesus came to me and healed my soul with the wonder of his touch so now i'm giving back to him all the praise he's worthy of i've been forgiven and that's why i love him so much and i've come to pour my praise on him like all the oil. No, you don't 
So I hope that will be an encouragement to you. Because at some time, we all need a fresh start. And it's amazing when you need a fresh start in life, the places that God may lead you and how God will use you in the ministry. And I've been, uh, this has been a theme on my mind for some time. Recently in July, we chartered a ministry and we titled it A Fresh Start Ministries. And I begin to think about the fresh starts that I've had to make in my life at various times. And you know, with millions of people in the world today, just think about all the various kinds of fresh starts that people need to make. Of course, the greatest fresh start we need to make is the fresh start of salvation. We all need to be born again. And if you haven't made that fresh start, then it doesn't matter what other fresh starts you make. That's the one you need to make more than anything else to be born again. But, you know, there are all sorts of fresh starts. Sometimes people get addicted to drugs and alcohol, and there's a fresh start that needs to be made in their life there. Sometimes people go through a divorce, and there's a, re, a fresh start, or they have marriage problems, and they get back together. And then sometimes there's a rebellious child. Some people lose their job and have to start over. You can see, I could go on the death of a mate. That's not the fresh start you necessarily want to have to make, but you have to change your life. There are things that change in your life when that happens. And I began to think about some of the fresh starts in the Bible, and this doesn't cover them all, but think about Joseph from a prison to a palace. And he was able to say to his brothers who had sold him into bondage that what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Moses from a murderer to a deliverer of his people. And he said, who am I that I should bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt? Then in the small book of Ruth, from affliction to redemption. When she came back to her home after her husband had died and uh, her two sons, she said, call me afflicted. But there was a kinsman redeemer for her, and blessed be the Lord, who did not leave her without a kinsman redeemer. Then Elijah and this is going to be the message today, so let me just share a couple of, two or three others. David, from a shepherd boy to a king, the Lord said, Arise, anoint him. This is the one after all of his brothers had gone through. And the prophet thought either one of them could have been the very next king. Caleb, looking back with no regrets and looking ahead with great anticipation, at 40 years of age, he knew that he would go to the promised land one day, but he had 40 years to wait. And finally, at 85 years of age, he was able to say, I want my mountain. I'm ready to claim it now. So at 85 years of age, Caleb was ready for a fresh start. You see what I mean? The Bible is full of fresh starts. If you have your Bible, if you would, go to the 18th and 19th chapter of First Kings. Now I've titled this today, Snatching Victory from the Jaws of Defeat. Have any of you ever felt like quitting? Have any of you quit? Well, I want to tell you one of the greatest men of God ever got to a point in his life he was ready to quit after he had experienced one of his greatest victories. Now, you know, there are events that happen in life, and I know that we can remember the exact time and place when we were when those certain things happened. And I try not to do this too much. This is my first time to, to be here. But I'm a UT graduate and uh, grew up in Memphis. And when I pastored down there for several years, all three of our children were born in Memphis. And uh, you know, there are all sorts. There's Alabama fans, Ole Miss fans, Mississippi State fans, University of Memphis fans, Arkansas fans, Alabama fans. Memphis doesn't have just any one team everybody supports more than the other. So one of my goals as a father, first of all, is get all my kids saved and then get all of them to be UT fans since I'm a <laughs> UT graduate. And I can remember one time when Mallory was about five or six that was her first UT game Peyton was the quarterback we were playing Southern Mississippi it was a cold day but we were in the upper deck there at Neyland Stadium and boy at first it looked like Southern Miss was going to run all over us but right before halftime Peyton got hot and when he came out in the third quarter they put the game away but I've got a picture of it and I'll never forget 
Wanda kind of poked me and said, look at that. And I looked over there, and there was Mallory, and boy, she was all bundled up, and it was cold. She had a mouth full of popcorn, and she said, go Vols, go Vols, and just hollered that for two or three minutes. And I said, doesn't that bless you? Amen. <laughs> and I tell you what, she's gotten to be a worse fan than me when it comes to, to some of that. But anyway, in 1998, we would always come up for a football game every year, usually at homecoming. We lived in Memphis. And sometimes Brandon played for Briarcrest Christian School. If they had a game on Friday night, we'd get through. We'd go back to McDonald's in Memphis and get food and then drive all night and come up here and be ready for the homecoming game the next day. Well, they played UAB that year, and I think Tennessee was number two or three. Well, after Tennessee had won the game, we were sitting in the stands, and Ohio State was playing, and they were behind, and they were number one. So I remember very clearly that day staying there even after the game and several hundred people had gathered to hear what was going on and finally got the word Ohio State lost and Tennessee was number one. Wow. I graduated in 74 and it had been a long time since Tennessee had been number one. So we went back uh, home in Memphis, but we had to come back up the next Friday night because Briarcrest played Webb and won the semifinal uh, games for the state championship. So we were here on Friday night, Briarcrest won, but Saturday we had to drive back to Memphis again. I remember going out to the mall and seeing all the people out there in West Town who had come before the game started after we went to the mall. We went back toward Memphis, and the first half wasn't very good for UT. Arkansas got a big lead, and UT fortunately scored right before the half, but we turned the game off. Brandon and I couldn't listen to it. It was making us too nervous in the drive. And finally, we got down near Jackson, Tennessee. It was getting near the end of the game. Tennessee had made a run, and it looked like they were going to come back and snatch victory from the jaws of defeat when all of a sudden on fourth down, the pass went incomplete. All Arkansas had to do was run the clock out. I almost feel like they could have taken a knee, but for some reason, they decided to do a play where the quarterback would roll out just to kill a few more seconds but one of the UT players had hit a lineman from Arkansas and it kind of pushed him back and Clint Sterner tripped. The ball hit the ground and he fumbled and Tennessee recovered. I remember we were in a traffic jam at that point. There had been a wreck. And we had turned the radio off after Tennessee had gone forth and out and Wanda was making fun of Brandon and I said, all you big babies, you need to listen to the game. So we turned it back on and all of a sudden there had been the fumble. Well, you know the rest of history. Tennessee took the ball down the field, and right there in the closing moments of the game, they snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. I tell you what, it didn't look like there was any way they were going to win that game at one time. Our minister of music had already called my house after Tennessee went forth and out. And on my answer machine, when I got home, he was making fun of me. He said, whoo, pig suey. And he was talking all that. Well, when I hit the button again, the next one was him again. Pastor, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Boy, I, I gloated over that one, you know. Snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. Sometimes, folks, it looked like we're not going to make it. We want to quit. And sometimes we just feel like, Lord, I don't think it's worth going on. I, I watch the use. Well, I know we've all been there. But guess who else has been there? Elijah. If you look in the 18th chapter of first kings one of the greatest victories that elijah had ever experienced in his life he thought he was the only prophet of god around took on 450 prophets of baal which would be like worshiping the devil but with god on his side he was a majority and so if you have time read the story later i won't read all those verses but he actually they said whoever god is real they prayed that they would cause fire to come down upon the altar they built and that the fire, a fire sacrifice would be made. Well, the 450 prophets of Baal, they began praying. They began jumping around almost like a pep rally of some kind. And they kept trying to call down fire from their God, Baal, where their sacrifice happened. Even uh, it says that Elijah mocked them. I think we ought to be better sports, but you know, at times, but he mocked them. 
And finally, when it came time, he had them pour water on the wood, make a moat around the area of sacrifice, had them pour water again. And then when he called for his God from heaven, fire came down and consumed it. It was a great victory that day. And then they had not had rain for several years. And so Elijah began to pray, and it says there in verse 44 of chapter 18, and it came to pass at the seventh time as he was praying that he said, Behold, there arises a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up and say unto Ahab, Prepare your chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop you not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was rain. Two miracles had happened that day. First of all, when he prayed down the fire upon the wet sacrifice, and it caused the people in verse 39 to say they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. That was a miracle. The next miracle is when he prayed that rain would come when it had not been there for years and it rained. And then the next miracle, it says that Ahab rode in his chariot and went to Jezreel. In verse 46 of chapter 18, the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. That man was running pretty fast. He was running at supernatural speed to keep up with the chariot. So there's three miracles right there that Elijah had experienced. But notice verse 1 of chapter 19. And Ahab told his wife Jezebel all that Elijah had done. You would think they would be rejoicing that they had rain again. The drought was over. But it says how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also. If I make not your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. In other words, Jezebel said, Elijah, we're coming after you and we're going to kill you. Whew. What a turn of events. I want to share five principles today and do it quickly. Probably a couple of things to illustrate them, but I could illustrate with Scripture after Scripture in the Bible each thing that I share with you today. But have you ever felt like Elijah? I want to tell you one of the most vulnerable, vulnerable times we have is when we've had some of our greatest victories. When we've been on the spiritual mountaintop. When God has worked in power. And then the next thing we know, that's when the devil and his demons are going to do anything they can to try to snatch defeat from the victory that we've had. First principle today, it's a major adjustment to come down from the mountain of spiritual victory to the valley of everyday reality. Years ago, Brother Bruce and I will probably remember some of these songs and a few of you others, but uh, Amy Grant, one of her first known Christian songs was Mountaintop was the name of it. I love to sing, I love to pray, worship the Lord most every day. I go to the temple and I want to stay to hide from the hustle of the world and its ways. But I love to stand on the mountaintop, fellowshipping with the Lord. I love to stand on the mountaintop because I love to feel my spirit soar. But I've got to come down from the mountaintop to the people in the valley below or they'll never know that they can go to the mountain of the Lord. Now praising the Father is a good thing to do. Worship the Trinity in spirit and truth. But if we worship all the time, there'd be no one to lead the blind. I'm not saying that worship is wrong, but worship is more than just singing a song. It's all that you do and everything that you say. It's praising the Lord every day. Oh, we love the mountaintop, don't we? I tell you, I've always made it a point, and I know Brother Steve has done this too. I've tried through the years and the churches where I've pastored to bring the best preachers into our churches that I knew of, to bring some of the best singers. You know, I know you've had an affiliation with Mike Speck. Man, there's nobody with the hand of God on him today when it comes to writing praise and worship music for churches and blending the, the hymns of the faith with the newer songs and what Mike Speck has been able to do. And, 
And I'm just thankful for a man like him. He'll go to any size church and minister. But you know, I, I, I've even taken my kids through the years. And when we go to Southern Baptist conventions, we love the pastor's conference, and we'll sit there for hours because I wanted them to hear the greatest preachers of the day. And it's had an effect on them in a positive way. And we love those mountaintop experiences when we go to the conferences. And what do we want? We want to stay there. But the everyday reality is that life is not like that mountaintop. And I like how that song says, I've got to come down from the mountaintop to the people in the valley below or they'll never know that they can go to the mountain of the Lord. Elijah had a mountaintop experience his spirit had soared, but then he got to a place in his life where he had to come down from the mountaintop, back to everyday reality where people don't like you. People even want to kill you. Second principle is this. It says there in verse 46, the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. When the hand of the Lord is on you in power, the hatred and jealousy of those with less accomplishments is usually against you. You know, we're in a day that that's different than any time before because of text messaging, emailing, reality shows, call-in shows on the radio. I've never, I mean, people are just outright critical and mean today. <laughs> Everybody's an expert. I've preached a couple of times for some pastor friends, and I tell them, aren't you glad we don't have church talk like sport talk? And people call in today, oh, boy, my pastor missed it this morning. On point number two, he used this scripture passage, and he should have used this one. You, you see what I mean? If we had church talk, people wouldn't, they, they'd be getting out of church and couldn't wait till they could get on the radio and criticize something. That's just the mentality that we have today. Through email, we say stuff, mean stuff, things about people we don't even know.